So welcome everybody. This is our, this is Food Stories. And today we're here with Julie Hickey from Hello Sunshine Urban Farm. And she's going to take us through her journey from being a grade 12 science teacher to being a part of the food industry. So we're super, super excited to chat with Julie. Uh, so today we are just going to chat a little bit with Julie, find out about her and this crazy story from going from science teacher to food um, being part of the food chain, uh, she has this amazing garden where she runs her business out of her uh, home. And so we're lucky enough that Julie's going to take us on a tour of her garden. So I'm looking forward to that, Julie, because uh, as we know, I'm not the best gardener. So I was, I'm always inspired by those who are. Uh, and following that, we'll just chat a little bit about seeds, her business, and all kinds of stuff. You'll have lots of chances to ask questions and to participate. All right. With that being said, I'm going to say welcome, Julie. It's so amazing to see you. Hi, Maxine. <laughs> so, uh. I like when you told me this story, I was very fascinated. So, before we even get to the whole science teacher turn, uh, food uh, chain supplier. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you, about your cultural background, your heritage, like who's Julie? Who's Julie? Uh, I'm middle-aged and I'm still figuring that out, like a lot <laughs> of people, right? I think we change throughout our lifetime and, and what we thought we wanted to be when we were a teenager or even a little kid is so completely different um, when we get to this stage of our lives. Sometimes we just need a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, who uh, who am I? Um, I am a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a teacher. I'm a seed saver. I'm a plant grower, obsessed plant grower. Um, yeah, I I uh, I'm still trying to figure out who I am, but I'm enjoying the journey. I think well, that's that's the biggest thing, right? Is that you kind of have to stop and question yourself every once in a while and say, you know, am I, am I doing what I really want to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've questioned myself on that for years. Um, yeah. But I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, I, I like to say I was born on the West Coast, so born in BC, and, but grew up on the East Coast. Um, my dad was from the East Coast, from uh, Minto and Fredericton area of New Brunswick. Okay. So that's where I grew up. And um, as you and I were talking the other day, my, my cultural background is um, Irish, French, um, Russian, Ukrainian. So I, I do a lot of genealogy searches um, and finding more and more really interesting stuff. But um, I would say the predominant culture would be um, Irish and French Canadian. Okay. So... Yeah. Growing up, so I know there's a huge uh, population of French Canadians that are from like New Brunswick, from the from the West Coast. So can you just tell us, walk us through, what is it like? What was it like growing up um, in New Brunswick on the in the East Coast? When it comes to, I mean, it's a broad question, but when it comes to like food and your memories about food and family, what what kind of jumps into your mind? Uh, Holiday gatherings, um, for our family, it was very, you know, meat, potatoes, vegetable, um, with a dessert uh, every evening kind of thing. And, and my family were big on baking. Mm -hmm. um, my mom always made jam. So, you know, when, when the strawberries and rhubarb and blueberries and blackberries came out, you, you picked them, you went to the U-Pick, you helped your parents pick them, and you made stuff. Um, and honestly, I cannot, I'm sad to say I haven't made a pie in probably about 15 years. That's so <laughs> sad, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't make a lot of pie. So for me, it's jam, that, that memory of making jam with my mom, of baking with my grandmother, of homemade bread, of cookies and homemade donuts and big turkey dinners, things like that, and fish chowder, Finn and Hattie, which is a, a cream sauce with fish, and you put it over potatoes, uh, gumdrop cake, and I did make it. Wait, wait, so gumdrop cake? <laughs> gumdrop cake, 
So the um, rest of us, I don't think anyone else is from the East Coast at this point. So I think you need yeah. to wrap that up and tell us a little bit about what is gumdrop cake. Um, it is essentially a spiced, well, uh, for my family, it was a spiced pound cake um, with gumdrops baked into it. And <laughs> they had to be ganong gumdrops from the ganong factory in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. And um, yeah, so lots of cinnamon lots of nutmeg in it yeah yeah but it's really good and uh, i have to tell you <laughs> i was putting it on a plate this morning and my son just happened to come into the kitchen and uh and his eyes grew really big when he saw it I said, you, can have some, you can have some later yeah. so did you did you bring some gumdrop cake to show us because i'm super I did. oh my goodness I did. I'm going to okay. see if I can turn it around here. Okay. I'm learning how to use Zoom here. Okay. So this is like on my plant stand out, out front because I'm at front. So this is okay. gumdrop cake and I baked in a bunt pan and it literally has gumdrops in it. Oh my goodness. That right? looks, <laughs> that looks a pan crazy cake with and delicious. In it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I did... I did a little further investigation online last night. It seems to be attributed more or less to Newfoundland, but apparently uh, Ganong Chocolate Factory that makes the gumdrops did publish a recipe for gumdrop cake, and it's extremely similar to my grandmother's recipe. Okay, <laughs> so maybe that's the secret to grandma's cake. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Yeah, grandma's cake has a little more butter, a little bit more milk and the the nutmeg and cinnamon in it okay. and raisins but i don't like raisins so i don't include the raisins there's no raisins well you know what if you've got no in there you really don't need the raisins <laughs> no. there's enough sugar in there yeah already so yeah. is it cra is it crazy sweet uh you know what it's not crazy sweet i don't think well, i don't know others might think it's crazy sweet but um the more the less the sweetness comes from the gumdrops for sure yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is, that's very interesting. I, I always find the most unique foods that come out of the, the East Coast. <laughs> and so that is yeah. one that I had not heard of before. So what, yeah. like there was, there was another um, dish you, you had mentioned to me before and it was something with potatoes and it had. Fin, yeah. The Finn and Hattie. That? Finn and Hattie. It's, um, it's a like white fish. You can actually buy the fish in cans. Okay. Um, but I don't know if I've seen it around here. I haven't made it in years, um, but it used to be kind of a bit of a staple in our family when yeah. I was young. So it's um, it, kind of like a bechamel sauce in a way, like a, a cream sauce, um, thickened with flour or cornstarch, usually with flour. And then you mix the fish with it and, uh, and you put it over mashed potatoes. And then you'd have that with a side of peas or carrots or something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah there's lots of interesting foods there <laughs> yeah but there was one other so i remember that one mm. and there was something else you said the potato and it had like bacon fat or bacon drippings oh or... my god i don't know if it was a family recipe <laughs> or well it was a family recipe i don't know i haven't heard anybody else talk about it but it's like a mashed potato but it's really well seasoned with um you know, like the, the poultry seasonings, you know, lots of sage and thyme. And um, so it's mashed potato with that, but we called it potato dressing okay. instead of, you know, like a, a bread um, stuffing or whatever. So potato dressing and you would bake it. So in a big cast iron pan or big mm -hmm. pot in the oven, and then you'd put little holes in the top of it and then you'd drizzle um, I remember bacon fat okay. being used and turkey drippings. My dad doesn't seem to think the bacon fat was used, but my brother does. Right. So, but, but that was my father's mother's recipe. So my grandmother Hickey's recipe and my mom used to make it, but the recipe seems to have been lost. And I haven't asked my cousins if they ever had it. Right. I do remember my grandmother making it and teaching my mom, and then mom made it. Um, but my mom passed away 10 years ago from Lou Gehrig's oh. disease. So it's going back and looking for all of those family recipes that you kind of wish you had asked for, mm -hmm. you know, long ago. Um, you just want that 
those comfort foods, those things that make you think of your childhood and you want to try and pass those on to your kids. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Like, that's the thing, like retaining culture through food is such yeah. an important part because, you know, a long time ago, like even up to like 60, 70, 80 years ago, I guess more like 80 years ago, people just really didn't write down the recipes so much. It was just... Yeah people made them the it was held with like the grandparents um and they passed on those traditions so as you know time is going on it's easy for those recipes to get lost um but it's like food is that way of just connecting us with our culture and who like a sense of who we are so i would definitely say that it's a point like it's really important um to retain that and like pass even if it's one or two really special family recipes to, to the next generation. Yeah, I, I, as I was telling you the other day, my other grandparent, my, mom, my mom's mother, so my grandmother McLean, um, her parents were Ukrainian Russian. Okay. And my mom seems to remember as a kid having, you know, cabbage rolls and pierogies and things like that. But I don't remember my grandmother ever making them. I didn't even know until maybe about 12, 13 years ago that there was Ukrainian Russian heritage. Oh, and really? Yeah. And even my cousin this year um, didn't, didn't have a clue. She had posted something on Facebook about making a dish that honored her husband's Ukrainian heritage. And I said, wait a minute, we're, we have Russian Ukrainian heritage too. Grammy's parents were Russian Ukrainian and she had no clue. So oh. it's, it's things like that, that just, I guess, weren't talked about, mm -hmm. um, which is strange to me because I see the, you know, the Ukrainian community as very much holding on to their heritage. And I, I don't know where along the line it was lost for me, but, um, but I'm yeah. looking into that. Yeah. So was it your, so your, your grandmother, was she, mm -hmm. um, is it her heritage? Your mom's grand, your uh, mom's mom. Absolutely. Yep. Her grandparents were first generation Canadians from the Ukraine, from, from Russian Ukraine. So her parents would have been first generation Canadians and my grandmother would have been second generation Canadian. So I, I don't know what happened. Um, they were Mennonites who came over to Canada, to Manitoba, I, and then yeah. ended up in Alberta. And I don't know where along the line some of those, you know, connections were lost, but apparently yeah. they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, I guess, because once by time, uh, like you, your generation came along, I guess you were maybe about fourth generation Canadian then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so a few generations down, we adopt sort of the culture that we're in, and mm -hmm. it's easy to kind of have things kind of change in that way. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. So you kind of like gravitated towards gardening. So I, I'm just wondering, like, so was it, who, who was the gardener in the family? Like, who, where did that come from? Um, my grandmother, Hickey, always had a big garden. Um, I remember being really, really little and um, picking beans and rhubarb. I have like strong memories of rhubarb and picking choke cherries and making choke cherry jam and eating. He used to give a jar of sugar and a, a couple of stalks of rhubarb and you dip the rhubarb in the sugar and chew on it. Oh, wow. Is so sour. Um, <laughs> But I, I remember that and, and tall, tall hollyhock flowers and she loved her, her um, snowball bush, the viburnums, and she loved lilacs and roses and yeah, things like that. But um, with my parents, we always had a garden. I grew up in, in a rural area just outside of Fredericton called Douglas and Keswick Ridge. Um, and I live in Keswick, Ontario now, which is kind of funny. Um, but my parents always had a garden. Yeah. I, I remember as a kid, um, sometimes, you know, frost would come in the fall and they'd wake us up really early and we'd go out and pick, you know, all the green tomatoes off and, um, and watering beans, you know, coming home from school and getting out the watering can and watering all the beans. And mm -hmm. um, my mom always preserved things, you know. We just did. We preserved. My dad was a hunter, so we always had deer meat. Um, we always had lots of vegetables. 
uh, I grew up in apple country. So the area where I grew up, um, Keswick Ridge and Douglas, uh, had a lot of apple orchards. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, to the point where there was an apple orchard right across from where the bus picked us up. So in the morning we, we go and fill our backpacks with apples and eat them all day. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the farmer, he probably knew that, but yeah. So those are yeah. some of the memories that I have of gardening and my mom always had, you know, beautiful flowers. Um, but it wasn't something that I ever thought of necessarily as a, as a career. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so that, that's interesting. So you didn't think of it as a career. What you thought of was, so I guess science was something that had always been of interest of yours. And so yeah. now where, did you, so did you uh, learn, well, like tell me your path about just getting from, okay, so now yeah. you're growing up, it's time for college or university yeah. and you decided you wanted to do science or you decided you wanted to be a teacher or how did that work? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I. I, um, I had parents who definitely pushed me in towards the sciences and engineering. Um, I, my father was an engineer, my mom was a nurse. Uh, all three of us, sibling, my, my brother, sister, and I were, were very much pushed towards the sciences and engineering. Um, I loved the arts, uh, drama. Um, I loved cooking. After my first year of university, so I went to the University of New Brunswick um, mm -hmm. for science. And after my first year, I had wanted to do geology originally. And then I got in the line for biology because I enjoyed first year bio. And at that point in time, they didn't have computer registration. You actually had to go from prof to prof and get little cards signed. Um, so this was early 1990s, little card sign. And I was in line for second year biology class, bio, um, not biochem, uh, anyways, a second year biology course and the, the lineup was long. And then somebody came out of the prof's office and said that they got the last registration tag. And the lineup was still huge. Like people still wanted to get into that course and the university mm -hmm. did not open another course. So for second year bio, if I had wanted to be a bio major, I needed that course and there was no way I was gonna get it. So mm -hmm. I went with my second choice, which was chemistry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, I have a chem so I have a chemistry degree kind of by default in a way. I, I, I can't say it would have been my first twice. I, you know, I enjoyed the ride. It was a small faculty, but um, thinking back, biology probably would have been the better choice, but yeah. I got on a different, different path entirely and, and ended up, um, oh, in a roundabout way, I ended up on the West Coast working there and um, earn enough money to come back uh, to do my teaching degree. Okay, so then yeah. you got your teaching degree. Um, yep. And so, and so when you were teaching, um, when you're teaching science, like was that in Toronto? Is it, was that in Ontario? Was it in New Brunswick or a little bit of both? Uh, I started in New Brunswick and uh, at the time the climate there was that there weren't that many teaching jobs. There just weren't. And Ontario was hiring. So this was um, the late 90s, so 1999, 2000. And my aunt Donna, who was also a teacher, um, called some people that she knew at a few private schools uh, here in Ontario to see if anybody was hiring. Mm -hmm. And somebody gave her a list of schools that might be hiring. So I applied to one to appease her. I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave New Brunswick. <laughs> I didn't want to be home. Yeah. Um, but, but I was supply teaching and I had been supply teaching for about a year and a half and, mm -hmm. uh, and working two other part-time jobs and I needed something to live on and I, I wanted the experience. So I applied to the one job and wouldn't you know, I got it. <laughs> oh, wow. So then that's so, how you ended up here. That's how I ended up in this area and my brother at the time was at the University of Toronto working on an engineering degree so his yeah. math was in engineering so I, I knew one person here in all of Ontario <laughs> at the time <laughs> when I moved up and then he moved shortly after I moved here so so I taught at the private school for two years and after the first year I actually met my husband yeah and that's how I ended up staying in Ontario um, so I came to Ontario met the guy Mm-hmm. Yeah. A little so, love story there. 
yeah true love story there so, so now um, yeah so then I, I ended up applying um, to my uh, current placement which is uh, here in Keswick and I've been here ever since okay yeah. So that's interesting. So now you're you're teaching. You 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 met the guy. Everything is going well. And so tell me about the day in your science class um, when you decided that you wanted to say goodbye to all this and hop into a totally different field. That's a loaded question, but uh, you know what? I, I'm I'm pretty open about it anyway. So teaching is a stressful job. I'm not gonna lie, it is. It's been very stressful on me. Um, and I had been doing some work in my biology classes with planting seeds with students. I decided to do that. I think it was back in 2014. I just picked up a bunch of seeds and some potting mix and we started planting in the classroom. Right. And it went really well using recycled you know, containers. We raided the recycle bin. Um, and the kids took home at the end of the year, they took home what they wanted to take, uh, and I gave stuff away that I could give away. And then I was left with a whole bunch. So my husband built some garden beds and I learned a lot that summer and kind of caught the gardening bug once again, kind of reminded me of my childhood, planting yeah. seeds and, and growing food and flowers, but you know, mainly food. Um, but for me, uh, it's been a stress reliever. So it's been my therapy. Um, mm -hmm. I do have issues with anxiety and depression. So I've found that the gardening really, really, really helps. I, throughout the winter, I very much look forward to getting back into the garden or at least planting some seeds and watching them sprout. And, yeah. and seeing that little bit of green, it gives me that little bit of hope to make it through through the winter because I yeah. find I find the winters and the falls the hardest yeah yeah winters are but, tough uh, winters are tough here for they sure. are yeah. yeah and I think a lot of people can relate to that absolutely um so for me it's um you know realizing that this is something that I absolutely love that I love talking about plants I love researching stuff about plants I I love looking at what plant diseases and insects, you know, that, that I'm going to have to deal with. I just, I, I think that's sort of the science teacher in me and, and a little bit of, you know, the curious child that I've always been. But gardening is, is something that um, it, it allows me to kind of forget all the stuff in the background. I yeah. sort of focus on what I'm doing at the time. I slow down, although with what I'm doing some, some days. I just, I'm up at six o'clock and I don't go to bed until one. Yeah. Um, but I enjoy it. It's one of those things that I can do that I, I don't lament doing. I, I right. do love it. Every once in a while you hit a wall, but you kind of sit back and you go, okay, well, I, I'm doing something that I absolutely love. Yes, I've had a hard day, but everybody has hard days. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So, so tell me then, how did you go from, so now you're, you found this, it's kind of stress relief, this place where you're finding lots of joy. It's kind of tying back to those childhood memories. How did that go now to being a business? Like, how did you go from, okay, this is something that I enjoy because lots of people use gardening as that sort of stress relief and, and yeah. uh, you know, and so how did you take that into like the business that you have right now? Um, I, I did take a stress, re uh, stress leave. Um, so I had been off and um, really thinking about where do I want to go from here? If, if I if I couldn't go back to teaching or if I didn't want to go back into teaching, what would I want to do? Yeah. And more and more, it just sort of screamed at me, you know, plants, 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 um, and growing food. So uh, the summer after that stress leave, um, I actually went to uh, York Region Food Network, hosted a meeting up in Sutton. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And I had been in the house for months, hadn't left the house, to be perfectly honest. And I signed up to go to this town hall meeting um, on food security, essentially, in the Golden Horseshoe. And I went to the meeting, I wasn't going to, my husband messaged me and said, are you going to go? I, I don't know, I don't feel good. He goes, go, just go, get out of the house and go. So I did. And I'm thankful that I did. I met um, Nathan McCosker from Clearwater Farms. So he was the, the head farmer there at the time. 
And uh, I had stood up in the meeting and I said, if you want more youth, you know, young people to go into farming, into agriculture, then you need to come into the schools and talk right. to them and promote it as a viable, you know, option. Because I, I had been teaching, I don't know, 16 you know, years at that point in time, and nobody had ever come into my science class or suggested yeah. agriculture as an option. Um, so I stood up and said my piece and, uh, and said, you know, somebody like me who wants to get into farming, I can't afford to here in Ontario. So you yeah. think somebody who's in their 20s is going to be able to afford to farm. It's cost prohibitive, prohibitive. the land right. cost alone. Um, anyway, so it's really Nathan, challenging for farmers. Yeah, it's really yeah. challenging for farmers. So Nathan, um, we, I, I, talked to him and said I wanted to volunteer and uh, and get that experience of working on the farm. So I went and I worked for a couple of days for free as a volunteer, I worked really hard. And after the couple of days, he offered me a part-time job for okay. the summer. <laughs> yeah. And he said, you, you lasted those two days. And he said, we had somebody who came and didn't even last, you know, a couple of hours. Right. <laughs> you know, digging in the hot sun. Who, so he says, you know, anyway, so I worked there. That was 2016. I worked there for the summer. Loved it. Um, decided to take a year off and go to Fleming College mm -hmm. and do their sustainable agriculture course. Okay. So I finished that in 2017. Yeah. Um, and then I returned to teaching and I did full-time teaching for a semester and that was probably, it was a huge shock to my system after being out for almost two years. Right. Um, so going back to the classroom while, you know, I enjoyed it, I also found it very challenging for me mm -hmm. because I wanted, in my mind, I wanted to be somewhere else. Right. Right. I wanted to be outside. I didn't want to be stuck in four walls, a floor and a ceiling. Um, I felt boxed in. It, it's, it was just an entirely different feeling. Yeah. So, yeah. So the following semester, I went back part time and then, um, and then I've been out of the classroom since last February. Amazing. And so yeah. that is the perfect little segue here. <laughs> so then you have these plants, you've been growing husband's been very helpful building beds and things like yes. that. And, and then you thought, okay, I'm going to work part-time at the school and then I'm going to do what? What else did well, you think you were going to do? <laughs> well, I wanted to grow cut flowers. So mm -hmm. since working at Clearwater and growing a few flowers there that first season, I've been wanting to grow more and more. So for the past four years, I've been doing a lot more research into cut flowers, um, trying various things here at home, growing in a small space, and you'll see how small I'm growing in when I yeah. take you around. Um, I don't think people realize what I've done to my backyard. You can't kind of <laughs> tell from the front. Um, I've used, I wouldn't say every inch of it, but I've, I've used a lot of my backyard for, for growing things. Yeah. Um, but this year is a little different. Um, this year, I think with COVID-19, it kind of put in perspective the whole food security issue and going back to, you know, I miss growing food. I okay. miss growing all the tomatoes and I miss growing Swiss char and I miss growing kale, but I still want to grow the flowers. So I'm I'm trying to do a bit of both, but it's, it is difficult making the decision for a small space as to what to put in and what not to put in. Okay. Um, because I also grow a lot of, I'm kind of switching from growing for cut flower for bouquet production to more growing the flowers for seeds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So getting some seeds. Okay. That's exciting. So would you be able to, I'm thinking that, so now we, we've heard all about your garden and I'm thinking that I'm so curious mm -hmm. that I need to see this space. Like I need to see what this looks like. So okay. um, why don't you take us on a tour okay. of your garden and maybe you can share with us like um, what crops you have, why you've chosen those crops, just like a little bit of a tour of what you have happening there. Okay, and when we're talking crops, we're not talking like huge amounts of stuff. Right. So this might give people a better idea of what they themselves could 
could do in small spaces as well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to grow maybe a little differently than most people would. I, I kind of toss seeds in sometimes and see what comes up. Anyway, <laughs> you, you'll see me. We'll see, we'll see how this goes. I'm going to start, I guess, with the front because I took over my front lawn. Mm -hmm. And I've made it into a, a perennial garden. Um, and I, but I grow fruit on my front lawn too. So anyways, I'll, <laughs> we'll take you on the tour. I'm going to turn this around a little bit. So okay. Turn the camera around. And, oh, there we go. Okay. So my front porch where, um, I just have various things in trays right now. Okay. I always have stuff on the front porch, it seems, but this is yeah. the front. Wow. I don't know. Can everybody see that? <laughs> yes. So what do you have going on? So there's, there's my neighbor's lawn right there. And then right. of course I've got in here. So the peonies, I normally would cut and make bouquets with peonies, but this year I let them bloom and I'm kind of glad I did. It's kind of cheerful. Um, so I have things that grow sort of in part shade. Um, so I've got anemones, Japanese anemones in here, and they don't bloom until late summer um, and early September. But right now it's, there, the foliage is all growing. So it offers cover for, you know, some other things that are coming up. And I've got sage and there's the rose bush around the side. And then my alliums, mm -hmm. I let them go to seed. So these are purple alliums. And I normally let them go to seed. Um, yeah. The seed heads, the seed heads can be used in arrangements as well. Um, but I do collect the seeds and I do grow from seed. Uh, it takes a few years to get okay. them to the stage where they're going to flower, though, from from um, from seed. And then I've got a little bench where I've got some pots of bachelor buttons and other stuff. Now this right here, this is baptisia, and it's almost done flowering. It's actually going to seed, so I'm going to try and get in there. Is that uh, is it is it a flower? It is. So this is actually, it's a um, herbaceous perennial. So it's not really a shrub per se, although it kind of acts. I'm in my own house and, and house Wi-Fi and, and non-Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull one of these off. So this is in peas oh. and beans. And you'll see that the little peas they put on are very much like little beans um, so I grow these um, it's a it's a native perennial so the the pollinators love it the foliage is beautiful throughout mm -hmm. the season and it grows new foliage every year right from the ground up um, the flowers are beautiful the pods are actually really pretty and they turn a deep sort of black color black brown color in the fall so it offers winter interest as well um, on the other side of that, I've got delphiniums growing. Yeah. Uh, I've got bee bug. I've got two huge gooseberry bushes. I'm going to try moving forward. Hopefully, I don't lose connection with you. Well, we can't really. Uh, I think your screen is frozen right now. Um, so we can hear you, but we can't see what you okay. are. Okay. So at. The, I'm thinking the front yard. I'm going to go around the side. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to skip the front yard for now because I find um, with our in their strange no man zone. Okay. <laughs> okay um, but what I, was, what I was showing earlier is that I have two gooseberry bushes. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we can so see there's that. Some goose, so there's some gooseberries that I just pulled off of it. Um, but I grow gooseberries, which are high in pectin. Yeah. For making jams and jellies. Very cool. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. No, that's really cool. So those are gooseberries. I love those. They're so yummy. Gooseberries. Yeah. They are. And actually, gooseberry rhubarb jam we, is, is the best jam I've ever tasted. It goes so quickly in our house. I call it rugu jam. <laughs> yeah, some rugu rhubarb jam. Rhubarb and gooseberries. Um, I've got <laughs> plants in trade still that I've got to get in the ground. So I've got uh, tomato plants and tomatoes. Yeah. Those are something that I grow and sell every year. Okay. Um, so I just sold out of the last of my tomatoes last night, actually. Um, so these have to go into the ground. 
and they've got flowers already. And I've got other stuff. So I've got a little greenhouse. It's um, eight by 12 size, which is the largest size that I can put um, here in my subdivision lot without getting a permit. Okay. Um, so so in the greenhouse, can, can you grow throughout the year in the greenhouse? Uh, not really, not unless it's heated. It does help to extend the season and keep things warmer. So if there's some crops that I wanted to grow, you know, something that I want to grow that likes a lot more warmth right. or needs more, more protection, then I can grow it in here. Okay. Um, if I wanted to heat it, I could extend the season. Um, there are some ways to extend the season uh, with cold frames and cover yeah. uh, as well. Nikki Jabour, um, other people might might recognize her name. She's an East Coast grower. She's got a couple of books out. One's on all season growing. Okay. Um, I highly recommend her book for growing throughout the season. But sometimes you want the break too. You don't necessarily want to grow all season. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's nice to have the break. Um, but I've got clematis that's growing up and around the top. I'm growing. Uh, this is Dusty Miller, Candy Can. Oh, beautiful. So it's going to flower right now. So I'm hoping to collect some of that as seed. Right. Yeah. That's I've got two, I've got, yeah, I've got two beds of that. Uh, this right here is Fama Blue Scabiosa. Mm -hmm. So I grow it for seed. So I've got a number of plants out on my front yard, but I also have plants here. These um, are just getting ready to bloom. This one bloomed the other day, so it's a little bit of a keener. But the greenhouse allows uh, these to grow taller. So there's one in the background that's quite tall. Yeah. Um, but also sooner. Right. And then I've got roses, uh, a couple of rose bushes that are in here as well to kind of protect. This one I actually trimmed back because I had some pest issues on it the other day. Yeah. And this right here, tripping over stuff, um, bachelor buttons. Right. So I'm growing those um, for seed, but they're also edible. So the petals uh, on many flowers are actually edible. You can add them to salads. Yeah, they're really beautiful. And they add such nice color and vibrancy and like different flavors. So I don't know if anyone has eaten flowers before, but they're really oh, yeah. great. They have lots of different flavors and dimension. Um, and it doesn't taste uh, like perfumey, you know, like sometimes mm -hmm. that's what I think, but it has, they have really beautiful um, flavors. So I, I was actually, I was actually really surprised with the um, roses. They actually taste, the petals taste really sweet. Mm. So it doesn't taste much like the smell, right? No, sometimes things do taste like that, but others are just, they kind of taste just like lettuce in a way, you know, they don't yeah. have an overpowering mm. taste to them. Mm. Yeah. So I'm curious, Julie, so you say you uh, grow your plants for seeds. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, like, do you then sell the seeds or like, what do you do with the seeds? I do sell the seeds. So I, okay. I collect the seeds. I, I started years ago. I'm, I'm a magpie. I, I collect little shiny things. Um, <laughs> it, it's like the kid who sticks rocks in, in his pockets all the time. I was that kid too. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's collecting seeds. I think is incredible. I mean, if you think about it, this tiny, tiny little grain will grow a whole big plant. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can collect, you know, thousands of seeds from some plants and grow, you know, from one plant, you can grow thousands. So I just found that fascinating. I also find that really fascinating. Or even just, uh, yeah, when you look at the little seed and then you have like an orange or like a tree grew from the seed or whatever. It, it blows my mind, like the amount of Absolutely. light and energy that exists small little confined uh, space amazing absolutely so this year I've got um, herbs that uh, that I've been growing in the greenhouse that I'm letting go to seed as well so I've got sage and I've got some catnip and I've got um, summer savory and I've got thyme and then I've got dill I don't know if you can see in, yeah. in the back way up yeah that's, that's dill it's it's getting ready to bloom. So 
see it. Yep, we see it. You know what? Dill with oh. blooms is so gorgeous also. I like the green fronds, and then you can use that in your pickling. Isn't that correct? That's exactly why I'm growing it. Um, I also grow it as a, a pollinator support plant. So swallowtail butterflies lay right. their eggs on um, plants within that family. So things like, the, and they really gravitate towards dill. So dill, Queen Anne's lace, carrot, any of those types of plants, the umbels, mm -hmm. um, they tend to go towards those. So I, I have noticed a few eggs on some of my dill plants that are out in the garden. Oh, wow. um, so I'm very, very happy about that. Oh yeah. If I can find one, I'll show you. Okay. So I'm just going to ask if anyone has any questions about just anything that we're talking about right now or any questions personally for um, Julie, you can feel free to type that in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we're going to continue with our tour and I'll, I'll uh, keep my eyes peeled on the chat if anyone has anything that they want uh, to say or to add here. Oh, and thank you, uh, Morgan. Morgan shared mm -hmm. uh, the link to Nikki Jabour, um awesome. to, her, to her website. So if anyone's curious about like growing um, and everything, like this was the book that uh, Julie recommended or the... Um, the uh, site that uh, Julie recommended. So you can always pop in there and, and take a look and see what, what uh, Nikki Jabour has to say. Okay, so let's continue on our tour. And I'm growing um, some eggplants and peppers and tomatoes uh, in pots. So I'm using various pots and uh, large pots. So these are the grow bags, which allow for air pruning of roots. Um, so they don't get sort of compact. Uh, so I've got a couple of tomato plants and I've got some some basil at the bottom as a companion plant. And here I just put in a few pansies at the bottom. Okay. Um, but I'm trying a few things like one of, the, <laughs> you can see there was something digging in here. I have some chipmunks that I'm dealing with this year. Okay. I like, yeah. to, I like to get in here. Um, but I'm trying different things as mulches uh, okay. for water retention. So one of the things I'm using is like pea gravel and straw, oh, he was in here too. Um, and then there's other ones where I don't have any mulch on at all. And I'm, I'm just checking to see in terms of their water retention, whether yeah. they stay, you know. And uh, so far so good with um, both the straw and the rocks. I find the rocks actually work really, really well. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm gonna put mulch on all of them. Yeah. So I'm just curious about the container gardening, because I know, um, mm -hmm. Like when I think about making a garden bed, sometimes it can feel like really daunting and overwhelming. So I like the idea of the container gardening. Now, is it every, like all kinds of plants you can plant in containers or there's certain kinds? Um, I would say it depends. Uh, for, you know, shrubs, obviously you don't want to keep them in smaller containers. You want to have larger, you know, larger pots. And I've got some large tree pots out here that I'll, I'll show you in terms of size, they're, they're huge. Um, but the larger the pot for, for things like peppers, eggplants and tomatoes, the better they'll do. They have more, more space for their roots. You'll just have to water them more often and probably add a little bit more fertilizer to them if, if they you know, lose nutrients over time. Okay. Um, that's sort of the only drawback is, is usually the watering aspect. You have to water them more often. They, because they have a smaller amount of soil and it tends to evaporate more often, especially from the um, the, fi the uh, fabric pots. Oh, so okay. I, find that, I find because they're breathable, they tend to, uh, water tends to evaporate a lot more from them as well. So we'd be, um, would we be watering it like once a day, um, making sure it's well saturated? That's kind of a loaded question as well. So um, a lot of times people want a, an actual schedule like how, how many days and it should actually be based on the feel of the soil whether it's still moist or not yeah so if I can put my if I can put my finger in you know knuckle deep or whatever and and it's still moist then I'm not going to water it I'll leave it but okay. if I notice the pot's getting a little light um and it's been really hot days like we're having now yeah then it'll need more you know water more often okay so it depends I mean it depends on the weather and it just depends on the, on the feel of the soil. I know people want an easy answer, but there's not yeah. really an easy answer to it. <laughs> I always so. want to, yeah, I, I'm always looking for the easy answer when it comes to gardening. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. 
Yeah. Me too. I'd like, I'd like easy answers too. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm growing stuff in crates as well. So, but with crates, you kind of have to look at what plants you're putting into them as well. Do they have a tap root system where they need, you know, a really deep root system? Uh, that might not be ideal, but these, these tomato plants are tiny Tim. Okay. Tomatoes. So they're not going to get huge anyway. Um, so they can have a smaller space. So right. I put tiny pims in a crate. So somebody who is doing, you know, a balcony or just has a, a small yard, yeah, you could get uh, milk crates or these are bulb crates that I got from a friend, um, like tulip bulbs and lily bulbs arrive in these. Okay. Um, so she, she gave me a bunch of crates that I'm using. Yeah. Uh, this bed, I'm going to dig most of this out. So the cranes bill, which is the white. Yeah which is a great, you know, little pollinator plant. It, it has a tendency to take over and be a bit of a bully. And this year it's taking over this, <laughs> this bed. This, yeah. one is, this one is a fantastic um, pollinator plant and it's cat mint. So cat there's cat mint. mint, yeah, cat mint and cat nip. Mm -hmm. um, and I grow both. They're great pollinator plants. Um, they just, they look beautiful as bedding plants too, so. Yeah, but yeah, more delphiniums. So I've got, uh, I put a variety of stuff in. So I don't just like, these are four by four foot beds. Okay. Um, and my husband and I grew them using um, decking boards. So cedar decking boards, cause they were cheap and cheerful. Yeah. And so, so are they deep? Like how, how deep are they? Like how much room do you need for the, for the roof? Yeah. Well, these are about a foot, okay. um, and the reason the reason I grow in raised beds is because the soil here um, in the subdivision, if you dig down about four or five inches, you hit rock. Oh. So when they when they built the subdivision, basically what they did was they filled in with whatever crap they had. Yeah. Sorry, can I say the word crap? <laughs> yeah. um, and then I think you're okay. And then they covered with just the worst heavy clay soil. And then they put sod on top of that. Okay. Um, so when we bought that house, we didn't buy it new. Um, we bought it about 14 years ago. Um, the backyard was all of this. <laughs> all of this was uh, essentially sod or grass, but it really wasn't, um, it really wasn't grass. It was more weeds than oh, anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like the kids were little, we played in it, we mowed it. Um, but like I said, I, I really didn't do anything to this until about 2014. So about six years ago. Yeah. So we lived here a good period of time. Whoop, there's a rug when it just swooped in. Um, we lived here a good period of time before we even did anything. So yeah. this row here, and I'll take you down this, this is a current bush. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's one current bush. Wow. It's enormous. And then I've got another gooseberry right next to it. So this was the first gooseberry that I started with. Yeah. And it's covered in berries this year, which is fantastic. But I need to time it so that I'm getting the berries before the birds do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so when, when do the currents, are the currents there right now? Like when do they... Um, yeah. Yeah, when is the, the, the currants are here, but uh, it won't be until July when, when they are red that I'll, I'll harvest them. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, but there's, there's lots of currants in here. Mm -hmm. Lots. So currant jelly, I make currant jelly with them. And again, if you're talking about, you know, heritage or, or family memories, I guess you could say, my dad grew gooseberries and currants um, in our backyard growing up yeah. and they're, they're still there. Um, the deer mainly get to benefit from them, <laughs> yeah. but uh, the deer population has pretty much exploded out there. Um, but, but I grow these and, and it's a little bit sentimental value and a lot of, uh, you know, I have food memories that come along with, you know, using these items to make jams and jellies and pies. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's netted underneath here is garlic. Okay. And there's a reason why it's netted. Um, anybody who has been following me um, on Instagram, and there's a scape. Oh, delicious. 
that I need to cut. Yeah, I actually managed to get scapes this year, which is fantastic. But here in Ontario, we have um, what is called a, a leak moth. And they lay eggs, which turn into larvae that will burrow down. Oh. Um, and then right, they can burrow right down the stem of the garlic and ruin your garlic. So okay. that's why, that's why, oh, there's one. Okay. So let's see if I can show this. I don't know if I can show this or not. Anyways, there's a little hole in this scape. Okay. You may not be able to see it. Anyways, that, that hole is a tell, telltale sign that the larvae has burrowed in. Okay. So I'm going to have to go through these and just check. So even though it's been covered, some of these things will overwinter um, in, the, in the soil yeah. as well. So but, with, the, uh, with the garlic, so you're going to, scapes are probably going to grow then in the next couple of weeks, right? Like you'll have more scapes? Yeah, well, actually, I've harvested the scapes this week. So this oh, is one that I, I had obviously left because it was still going. There's another one here. But um, I don't know if you can see that where it's cut. Yeah. I've already cut the scapes on those. Yeah. So this is the first year that I've grown garlic. Uh, I, I didn't grow it for the past two years. And the main right. reason was because of leek moth. And this year, I, I didn't cover it in time. They were affected, but I cut the, the stuff off. And then I put the covers on to prevent more. Okay. So I've got more garlic in here. So I'm growing actually eight different varieties, like small oh, bits of eight varieties yeah. of garlic. So I've got more garlic in here. So I've the got garlic sweet... you, planted, you planted them uh, last fall, I'm assuming. I did, yeah. I planted them last um, end of last, last October. Oh, <laughs> and I've got some Swiss char in here and yeah. I've got some broccoli. And you can see there's little holes dug in here. The chipmunk's been in here. <laughs> yes. They find a, yeah, they find a way and he likes to dig little holes to remind me that he's still here. Yeah. <laughs> so the garlic, so the garlic, is, so if anyone hasn't um, planted garlic before, you need to plant it in the end of the growing season, like in the fall. And you then do. in the springtime, it's going to grow those garlic scapes. Now you can harvest those, just trim those off because then it lets the energy go into the actual bulb instead of going into seed and flower. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah. can you see this right here? Yes. I don't know if you can see where it's eaten away. Oh yeah. So, so this is the scape. So that right there, I know that that's affected and I'm going to pull that off. Right. So I can try and use as much of the scape as I possibly can, but I do know that larvae have been into that. Right. So, so they've gotten in somehow. Yeah. And the garlic yeah. scapes, if anyone hasn't used them, they are so amazing. It has a really nice, like, garlicky onion flavor. So you can just chop it up and use it raw in any of your food. Um, or you can saute it and then cook it. Um, but the really cool thing is if you take the whole scape and you cook them, like, so in some cultures, um, people, um, like, saute them and make it into a stir fry or... Um, I, my favorite way to have them is to batter them <laughs> mm -hmm. like and fry it, which is so good. Um, yeah, I learned that from you last year. That was, that was amazing. That was like a so game delicious. changer. Yes. It's so delicious. And then the cool thing about the garlic scapes is once you cook them, they actually don't taste like garlic. It tastes more like green beans with like a garlic flavor. Um, Absolutely. when you have them raw, they're really intense, the flavor, but then as you cook them, then the flavor mellows out and they're absolutely delicious. Uh, I don't know if you can see that where the end of my oh. finger is. Yeah, I see that. That's, do you see the little larvae? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what you're looking for. Those are the little things that are gonna destroy your garlic. Mm. So he's gonna be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. I'm, re I'm removing him, but you know, it, in a garden, it's not going to be perfect. So if you're the kind of person who is a, a perfectionist and, and, you know, doesn't want to deal with pest issues, gardening may or may not be for you. You're just yeah. going to have to live, you're going to have to live with those pests, right? Like learn how to, to, uh, to handle them. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I've so got what some flowers. Julie, you can show yeah. us around for a couple more minutes, and then okay. I thought we could talk a little bit about seeds, um, okay. and just, because uh, I know that's a big part of your business, is like the seed saving, Dude. so, um, but like, I'd like to take a few more minutes just to see what else you have back there, and then if we uh, can chat seeds, and what we consider when we're buying, and 
about sea saving and all that kind of stuff. That'll be great. Absolutely. All right, so I do have some vegetables in here. One thing that I do is as one, one crop is finishing, so these are the alliums, in yeah. the understory, I either toss in seeds or I put my transplants in here to grow underneath. They oh. get a little bit of shade as they're starting. And then once these are done, I can just pull them out and then I've got more plants coming up. Um, what else do I have? I've got, my rhubarb isn't doing fantastic. So one okay. thing other people might be dealing with, see all those holes? Yeah. Slugs. Oh, is that what it is? You know what? I have a, yeah. a flower. I have some lilies in the front and it has those holes. So I'm, yeah. I'm just like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of times it's slugs. They come out at night and, and they're tiny. People tend to think of slugs as being, you know, a lot larger, but these are really, really small. Like some of them are only a couple of millimeters long. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, take a, uh, your cell phone, turn on the flashlight and uh, and go out at night and look a lot of times they're on the underside of leaves too yeah. um this is gooseneck loose strife it's a beautiful beautiful cut flower tends to be a little bit of a bully so you do have to kind of dig it and, and contain it poppies so i grow a few different types of poppies one being a pink peony to poppy and another one called i call florist pepper box which um have a variety of colors red purple um sort of a magenta color Beautiful. and then this this is bupleurum it's used a lot of times as a, a filler flower yeah and it's got these beautiful sort of yellow chartreuse flowers they're teeny tiny but they look gorgeous when you add them to other other bright colors like pinks and purples mm -hmm. so it really makes them pop so i've got some of that more garlic this year. I really went on a garlic kick. And, then I've got, <laughs> and I've got some poppies in here and I've also got some broccoli in amongst the garlic. So I do a lot of uh, what is called companion planting. Right. Um, and, and there are books on it or you can even look up online, just look up companion planting for garlic, for example. Yeah. And it will tell you what things will grow really well with garlic and what things won't. Like peas and beans do not mix with garlic in terms of growing. And is it um, that this, when you, is it, is it, does it not mix because they don't, they don't grow? Is that why it doesn't uh, work? Yeah. Or like, yeah. So some, some plants um, put out chemicals that prevent the growth of other plants. Okay. Um, so my understanding is that peas and beans don't grow well with garlic because of the root exudates. So mm -hmm. the things that the roots exude. Yeah. Um, these are, these are scabiosa. So they're a flower. Okay. And then I've got ground cherries in there. And then I've got foxgloves. I love these. Those are so pretty. I love them. The bell shape is so gorgeous. And I've got a bunch of them. Um, they like dappled shade. They like a lot of dappled shade. What does that and word mean? Got... <laughs> what is it? Sorry, I don't know what dappled shade means. It filters, it filters in a bit of light. So it's kind of like you have a tr the tree leaves where the light's coming through the tree leaves, but you have a lot of shade, but then you have the light that's sort of just coming through. Yeah. If okay. that helps explain. It does, yes. Um, I've got cosmos, cosmos in here. I do have zinnias, but they're young yet. I let this peony go and it's got to be cut back. Um, I've got nigella in here that's what this stuff is and it's a beautiful flower oh i think your screen froze again julie maybe you need a, a better spot oh, are you there uh, yeah i'm here oh okay because i think you froze a little bit i'm so, at the back of the, of, of the property that's probably why okay yeah so this is an extremely impressive garden that you have here. <laughs> so there's, you have so many things going on, so much happening. It's like amazing. So I'm super impressed. My three pots have not really started doing well. <laughs> so I just like, I, lo I love to see a thriving garden. So I'm just going to say thank you so much for taking us on a tour. Um, I think it was very educational. Like I learned a lot and it's just really cool to see just the different kinds of ways that you can do the planting and the companion planting and just 
how much you need to really pay attention to your plants so that yeah. you, you know what they need. So that, that That's also, right. yeah, you know what, that explains so much to me just about why my gardens don't do well. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a more kind of set it and forget it kind of girl. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to grow kale in containers this year. So these are young, they're little and some, yeah. but you know, animals. Yeah. I've got, I've got bunnies this year. I don't know if everybody else has, you know, lots of bunnies and chipmunks, but this seems to be the year for them. So I'm oh. using, using all kinds of stuff to cover. So yeah. if people are having issues, maybe covering things might be a good idea. Yeah. That's probably a good idea. All right. So we're going to just switch it up a bit. So again, thank you for the tour. That was really amazing. And I'm just like in awe of what I'm seeing here. Um, but I thought we would just take another few minutes and yeah, like just chat about seeds. Um, okay. So if you can tell us, so, um, so pretend like we have no idea what you're talking about because I kind of don't. And <laughs> And then just tell us, like, I know you talked to me about locally adapted seeds and what to mm -hmm. consider when you're buying seeds. Can you just talk a little bit about that and then maybe a little bit about uh, seed saving and you can show us some of your seeds and all that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, so locally adapted seeds, the, the idea is to buy seeds that um, are grown in your region that are adapted to the conditions of growing in your your area okay. so for example um, if I were to purchase seeds let's say from California they might be growing those in a zone 8 which is a lot warmer maybe they don't have uh, as much water or maybe they have a lot more water so those plants are used to growing in an environment where you have a lot more water I'm gonna turn the video around hi <laughs> Hi, you're back. <laughs> um, so here in Ontario, we deal in the summertime with a lot of drought. So we want plants that are well adapted to dealing with low water conditions. Right. Okay. So I, I don't want I don't want to grow, you know, zinnias that need to be watered daily. I would rather have zinnias that I would have to water only a few times a week. Um, maybe maybe I want to grow more drought tolerant plants. So I'm gonna choose something that is going to grow in an environment where they don't need a huge amount of water. Mm -hmm. um, or they are ones that bloom, you know, really nice and tall in right. our environment rather than shorter. Right. So I choose plants based on their ability to survive here, that they, they aren't very finicky, so they don't need huge amounts of of my time uh, in order to grow them. And they will grow well for me here. Uh, I also wanna know that they are plants, you know, I, I buy from, from seed growers that I know really, really care about their plants and are gonna take out those plants that have, you know, disease issues as well. Okay, okay. Um, so I look for a lot of smaller growers here in Ontario or even just in Canada. So I, I've purchased seeds from the East Coast, from Nova Scotia. Yeah. Uh, a couple of growers out there. There are a number of really great growers, especially organic um, seed growers here in Ontario. And Urban so, if, Harvest, sorry, Urban I was just Harvest, go ahead. Hi. Ur Urban Harvest being one, um, oh, okay. the, the Urban Tomato, uh, Hawthorne Farms. So, there's a lot, and you know, the funny thing is, they're all run by women. Oh, amazing. Those farms are all run by women. Um, so, you know, they were kind of my inspiration. But one of the things that I've noticed, um, especially for cut flower growing, is there are sources of seed that I couldn't find here in Canada for some of the things that I wanted to grow. Okay. Um, so I had been purchasing stuff from, from the UK and the States. And I didn't really want to have to do that because it's the shipping and it's also yeah. the duty charges as well on those items um, right. it makes it makes the seeds quite expensive so if if I can produce some seeds for myself or or produce seeds for others and give them easier access here in Canada why wouldn't I okay yeah so no that's, that's a great kind of, that's kind of how it started 
Okay, so um, I just want to, so you mentioned Urban Harvest was one of the seed yep. companies. Uh, Hawthorne? Yep, was Hawthorne like Farm. Okay. Yep, Hewlett well, Hawthorne well, Farm. And what was the last one? You said another one. Uh, the Urban Tomato, Jillian. The urban, okay. And she's based in Peterborough. Okay. So um, if you guys, if anyone's interested in just learning about uh, the, or checking out the seeds that they have, um, Morgan's pop those um, into the chat. So there's some links there to uh, Urban Harvest and Urban Tomato um, that she has right there. And I'm thinking she's looking for the Hawthorne as well. So just mm -hmm. if you're looking for, for seeds, um, thanks for those recommendations. Those are some uh, yeah. good places for seed growers. Now, what about seeds that you purchase? Like, so if I just go to the grocery store, or I just go to yep. like, like how are those seeds? Like how do they compare? What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, th they're fine as well. I, I do find um, if you buy from, for example, Bessie's or if you buy from uh, William Dam Seeds, um, a lot of the seeds that they sell, they don't grow themselves. They actually source other farmers around the world um, that grow the seeds and then they bring them in. So they are more of a, a seed distributor. Okay. So they package, they package the seeds that they receive and yeah. sell them, but they don't produce those seeds themselves. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so some the the smaller producers that I mentioned, they all produce their own seeds here themselves. Um, they grow them. Yeah. They collect them, they process them, and they package them themselves. Okay. So they know they know exactly how those seeds were grown. They can answer almost any question along the route yeah. as to what conditions they were grown in, et cetera. So that's amazing. So like, yeah. that, and that's like as local as you can possibly get. Um, so hang on, Julie, I have a question. Yeah. So somebody wants to know, can you explain okay. a little bit about the process of saving seeds? Do you have to keep it isolated from the others? What is the difference uh, between open pollinated and hybrids? And how do you okay. dry them and store them? So it's like a, like a multi-question in one. <laughs> this is a test, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we're checking. Does she know? Does she know what she's telling us? Okay. Does so, she know what she's talking about? Yes. Um, okay. So uh, open pollinated basically means that... Um, you can grow those plants, they are pollinated, and you can collect those seeds, and the result of planting those seeds, you're gonna get consistent results year after year. With the hybrid, it's the result of the pairing of two different parents, and then you get that particular offspring, but when you take the seeds from that first generation offspring and plant them, you are not guaranteed to have the same characteristics the following year. Um, so that's the difference. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't save hybrid seeds. Uh, you can, you just don't know what the results are going to be um, the next year. As far as, um, and, and I guess to, to also answer that question is, um, when I worked at Clearwater in 2016, my boss Nathan had me pulling tomato plants out um, from a row that had been in there the previous year. So they had self-sown. And he said that they had been hybrids and you never know what the tomatoes were going to be in terms of disease resistance or flavor or you know color so i was pulling them out and i'm crying <laughs> doing this <laughs> i took some of those plants home and planted them in a mound of soil and they were some of the best tomatoes i've ever had now i don't know what the parents were like you know like the the original plants were like but they were great um mm -hmm. so i mean you can still do that you just don't know what what you're going to get and I wouldn't go ahead and sell those those seeds because I couldn't guarantee to a customer what results they were going to get right um so what was the other question Maxine now so I'm if, thinking if, yeah so you answered that part which is perfect and then it just said um it's asking you just about the process and then okay. the storing and then and the distances too yeah um, okay, so distances between plants. So for example, um, some things like tomatoes are self-pollinating, meaning that um, they don't necessarily have to have a pollinator going from plant to plant to, to pollinate them or cross the pollen between the plants in order to get a tomato with seeds in it. Right. Um, so, and then 
uh, sweet peas, for example, are the same. They are self-pollinating, although there are some insects um, that will cross-pollinate them as well. Yeah. Um, but there are specific distances, and it depends on the plant, there are specific distances that you'd have to have between, um, let's say squashes, for example, are pretty famous in terms of cross-pollinating. Um, so you couldn't have like a zucchini and a pumpkin, a sugar pie pumpkin, uh, within a certain distance because they will cross pollinate, and then the seeds will result in something completely different um, so, the next year. So would it be like a cross between a zucchini and a and a squash? Yeah, some they call them really? Franken squash. They call them Franken squash. <laughs> or, or, yeah, yeah. My, my dad has had some interesting results because he's he's saved stuff that he's purchased before that's been you know grown in a big field, various types. Um, and then the next year he's he's sort of sown those in a compost pile and he's ended up with some interesting results. Oh wow! And can yeah. You can you eat those? Like if it's cross pollinated? Yeah, a lot of a lot of times you can still eat them. It's just you never know what the results of using those seeds are going to be. Right. There's no, it's not a it's not a consistent result. Yeah. Um, but there are books, a lot of books on seed saving. Um, I I don't have the links right now, but I can send those to you, Maxine. Okay. Uh, a couple of books that I've used in terms of. Um, you can look up the variety that you're growing, like peppers or tomatoes or particular, you know, flowers, and it will tell you the minimal distance that you'd have to have between those varieties okay. in order, to, in order to save those particular seeds. Mm -hmm. Other things that you can do are um, putting other crops in between. Right. So you plant one thing, then you put something in between as a barrier. Yeah. Before you plant something, you know, a similar variety. Um, and then caging as well is another one that you can use. So you can use uh, cages with a fine mesh over the top to kind of isolate. And another one is timing. That's another big one. So if you can time it so that you have one crop flowering earlier, right. and then you plant another one so that it flowers later so that you don't get the cross pollination, yeah. then that's another way. So there, there's multiple ways that you can do it even in a small space. Yeah. Or you can limit the varieties that you grow. And then like, so when the plant flowers and it goes to seed, now do you just like manually remove the seeds from, like do you manually take the seeds off or how does, how do you get the seeds? It depends. For me, it depends on um, the size of the seed as well. So some seeds are pretty big and they're easy just to like, you know, crush the the outer coating and and uh, get the, those seeds. Um, yeah. let, me, let me see if I can kind of, show you a couple of examples I'm kind of okay. in front of me. there okay um so for example these are nigella pods yeah and let's see if i can crush one open in my hand see if it actually has seeds in it this one doesn't have seeds uh it's got like little yellow bits so let's see if i can find one with actual oh that one i can see right now it's open. So yeah. you want to harvest things when they're dry, not when they're green. Okay. So, so I'll give you an example. These, uh, this onion, this allium, for example, I harvested at this stage, but I'm, I'm not saving it for seeds. I'm okay. saving this more of a, as a decorative element. Um, I want to save this. I don't know. Can you see that where it's all yes. crispy? Yeah. Okay. You want to save it when it's dark and there are the seeds in the bottom. Okay. And so okay. to, to harvest those seeds, you put it in that bag and then kind of shake it around. Is that what you did? Well, sometimes they put it in boxes or bins. For me, if I'm dealing with small amounts, I have like these organza bags that I put yeah. things in and I let them dry. Okay. So for example, this one I put in yesterday, it's penny press. Um, and I'm just leaving it in here and I hang it somewhere, you know, dry and, and warm and dark and, and it dries down beautifully. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to harvest things when they're green. So last year I saw people harvesting, you know, poppy pods when they were really, really green. And you want to harvest them when, so if you're harvesting poppies, you want to harvest them when the top starts to lift and you start to see these little holes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that way you can shake the seeds out. Mm. Okay. You can actually take these and tap, tap the seeds out into a bowl. So I've got this in, in a big bowl for the poppy pods. 
Um, but nigella, I'm gonna crush this one, has all these little black seeds. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you can manually remove them, but then there's other things that you can do in terms of sifting. So using sifters with different mesh sizes. So if you've got small seeds and lots of these larger pieces of what we call chaff or, you know, dead mat plant matter, yeah. um, then you can sift it out. You can use wind to blow away the lighter material and keep the heavier material behind. So when you say wind, so like what would you do, like a fan? Or you can use a fan. You can use, um, for me, uh, sometimes if I'm dealing with a small amount, I have, you know, a bowl and I have the seeds in the bottom with yeah. the chaff and I pick it up. And if there's a little bit of a breeze, you know, I'll just stand here doing this and letting the seed drop. Okay. And the wind will blow away the chaff and likely some of the seed as well. Yeah. Um, some of the lighter seed, but I, I do that. So winnowing which is using, you know, using the wind to, to get rid of the lighter particles and yeah. keep the, the heavier seed behind. Yeah. But other, other things like beans and peas that have, you know, larger seeds, those are really easy to collect. You know, okay. you, you put them in a pillowcase, you crush, yeah. you know, you, you bash the pillowcase around a bit and, and then, um, you remove, you know, the lar the larger bits of uh, of beans and peas. Yeah, and then you get the seeds in the bottom there. But then you have really teeny tiny seeds. So this yeah. is Nicotiana, which is a lime green tobacco, flowering tobacco, and they are teeny tiny. Oh wow! Yeah, little tiny seeds. So those I tend to sift out, and then I use, and you can see there's little bits of chaff still in there. Um, and then I tend to use wind to get rid of any of the remaining mm -hmm. little bits. And so um, then I see you storing them in mason jars. Like, is that our best bet? Like, of how to store? Like, so once we've harvested our seeds, and you know, like our plants are dry, mm -hmm. we've taken the seeds out. And now, is this the method that you have there with the mason jars? Is that the best way to store them? I do. Uh, I either use glass jars or I use paper bags. And um, the glass jars I use because I, I store my seeds in the fridge. Okay. So I want them somewhere cool and dry. Um, and keeping them in the glass jars keeps them nice and dry and the fridge keeps them cool. Okay. So it yeah. helps, that, that just helps to extend, you know, their, the lifetime of the seeds. Yeah. By keeping them cool and dry. So once you but have, you, so, so from this season and you've harvested and you have your seeds, if you've cared for them well and they, they've been kept like cool and dry, um, mm -hmm. how, how many years can you then use those seeds? It depends on the seed. So um, I have tomato seeds that this year my dad gave me and they were about 11 years old and they grew just fine. Wow. Um, I have chive and onion seeds that usually last a year. That's it. So okay. unless you use, unless you, you use them within a year, most times um, their viability goes down significantly. But yeah. the answer to that question is it it totally depends on on the seed that uh, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So some beans. I had some beans that were you know in, in my basement, which is cool and dry. Um, and I was trying to get them to germinate, and they are they were probably about five years old, and I didn't get any to germinate. Okay. Not a one. Yeah. So, but then again, those tomatoes were, you know, tomato seeds were 11 years old that my dad had stored in his basement and they, they germinated just fine. Right. So, so it really depends. It, it totally depends. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say when you purchase seeds, for the most part, you are going to get at least a couple of year, good years um, for those seeds. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily toss them, um, you know, after a year or after two years. Yeah. Yeah. So you I just would try them. Yeah, and see what happens. That's that's all we can yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, you, you can do a germination test and a, and a lot of time when I do germination tests on all my seeds. So I I always test to see, you know, how many are going to germinate. Yeah. from the ones that I collect before I sell anything. I want to make yeah. sure that they they grow well. Yeah. Um so, you know, you take a sample, a random sample of seeds and I might do two rounds, you know, where I take 100 seeds and I put them on damp paper towel 
um, and then I put them in a baggie and I put them, you know, under the grow lights. Some are warm, warm and damp. Yeah. And um, and usually they grow just fine. If so they you don't, don't then I, if they don't grow, then I know there's something wrong and I I I can't sell them. Yeah. So you you uh, germinate them on with paper towel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. they don't so no soil. They don't they don't necessarily need soil to start. Yeah. Yeah. No, they just need, again, somewhere, you know, they need warmth. Uh, some need light. Some don't need light. Some need like to germinate in darkness. Mm -hmm. um, again, depends on the plant. Uh, and moisture. That's sort of their trigger is, is warmth and moisture. Yeah. So they don't need soil right away. And in fact, that is how I start a lot of things like delphiniums and larkspur that are more difficult to germinate or um, something like columbine. When I discovered that for columbine, the rest was history. <laughs> I, I couldn't get columbine to grow. I would toss them, you know, people were like, oh, they're easy to grow, you know, toss them into my garden. They wouldn't grow. Yeah. Nope. But put them in paper towel, damp paper towel and let them start. And then take those once they first start, you know, put germinating putting out a little root yeah then put that into your soil and they will grow just fine and they'll grow amazing mm -hmm. julie yeah. you have like enlightened me like and, and i'm sure our listeners like so much about seeds and i'm telling you just have cleared up why like my gardening <laughs> just doesn't work this is definitely a labor of love like it seems like I you have this. to put so much uh, care and attention to what you're doing. And it just shows like the importance of our farmers, importance of like getting those pollinators happening so that we can have our food. There's so much work and knowledge that has to go behind like creating any of these plants and creating our food. So um, yeah. yeah, so it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing to see. And so thank you so much for walking us through that sort of, um, piece there. We have a couple more minutes. So I don't know if anyone else has uh, any questions. If you do, you can pop them into the chat. Uh, we have shared Julie's contact information. Um, so if you're looking for seeds, here's your lady, um, as well as um, do you still have any plants that you're selling right now? Um, I'm kind of winding down on, on plants right at the moment because I'm trying to concentrate on getting um, some of my own things in the ground okay. uh, to, grow, to grow for seeds. Um, yeah, and just sort of, I, I notice every year there's like this big rush for plants, sort of uh, March, April, May, and early June. And then June, it just sort of wanes off. Sense. And I think, I think because everybody has their bedding plants and everybody has, you know, their seeds that they're growing already. Um, yeah. So it's nice to have that little bit of lull before, you know, fall kind of hits. And, and some people are looking for perennials to put in for fall. I, yeah. do, I do grow perennials to put in in fall, things like um, Sweet William, Fama Blue Scabiosa. Um, I have some GMs. And you want to get those in sort of end of August, early September, and then let them overwinter. And then they'll bloom really nicely in the spring. Oh, see, I like those. Yeah. I like, I like those yeah. kind of like, oh, and there it is in the spring, my garden. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so do I. I love that. So, so that's what I'm going to be concentrating on right now is um, seeding up some, some crops under the grow lights to pot up for, um, for fall planted perennials or cool okay. flowers. Actually, I highly recommend if, if people want to grow a cutting garden and they want really nice early flowers, one book that I really recommend is, um, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and it's called Cool. It's called Cool Flowers. Okay, so Cool Flowers. Yep, um, and you would sow those. Some of those, um, I can re recommend. You know, some of them that grow really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, so you start them off end of August, and you grow them through September, early October until frost, and then leave them through the winter, and they will come up really nice in the spring, and you'll get earlier flowers that way. Oh, so beautiful. you're not start, so you're not seeding them in the spring and waiting months and months and months. You seed yeah. them early and then you kind of seed them and forget it almost. Yeah. Uh, see, there we go. Again, this is more, this is more my style. <laughs> Things that are low maintenance. Well, I'm just going to say a very, very big thank you, Julie, for um, just uh, educating us, taking us through your garden and just sharing a little thank bit you. about you and your family. Um, definitely gumdrop cake is on my list to try. <laughs> yeah. 
So I will let you all know how it goes. I'll take it inside. I'm sure my son will want a piece right away. (laughs) So we'll give that a try. If anyone else tries gumdrop cake, let me know how it went. But on that note, I'm going to say thank you to Julie. Uh, Thank you to everyone who was listening and participating. Uh, If you have any questions for Julie, her uh, contact information is posted in the chat. And it's been another amazing food story. I thank you, Morgan, for your assistance. And uh, I thank everyone for spending the uh, morning with us. So everyone have an amazing day. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you.